Well, good morning. Uh, I want to welcome everybody uh, to the Cato Institute, both everybody who's here in person and all of you watching online, uh, to our special half-day conference, or you might say double forum. I don't know how you want to quantify that. Uh, but we're going to be talking about, of course, college accreditation, I think more broadly about college quality. Uh, I also want to thank everybody who's sort of following this debate 140 characters at a time, uh, all of you who are on uh, Twitter uh, following us at hashtag college accred. Uh, and I also want to extend special thanks to Judith Eaton and the Council on Higher Education Accreditation, which helped us a great deal uh, to put this event together. My name is Neil McCluskey. I'm the Associate Director of the Center for Educational Freedom here at the Cato Institute. And again, the purpose of today's conference is, of course, to examine Really, I think the best way is ultimately to drive quality and efficiency in higher education, which is an industry, and, and I really think you can apply the term industry to higher ed, that can often appear, at the very least appear, uh, to suffer from both substantial quality and efficiency problems. Uh, today, we're going to examine really two major components of this problem. Uh, the first panel, which we'll be starting momentarily, uh, on that panel, we'll look at the role of the federal government, which furnishes billions of dollars, and I'm going to give you some more exact figures in a moment, uh, billions of dollars every year to the higher education system. Uh, and in particular, then, we're going to talk about the threats of federal policy that's connected to that money that might be posed to college accreditors, and through them, or perhaps around accreditors, to colleges themselves. Uh, in the second panel, speakers are going to tackle the problem of how you hold accountable these new forms of higher education uh, that we see, of post-secondary education, that don't fit in the kind of traditional model of four-year, ivy-covered residential colleges and universities. Think about massive open online courses, which you've probably heard a whole lot about, those sorts of ways of delivering post-secondary education. And with that, let's get right to panel one. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our moderator. Then I'm going to let him introduce the, the panel and the panelists. Our moderator today is Doug Letterman. He's the editor of Inside Higher Ed and one of its three founders. With Scott Jashik, uh, Letterman leads the site's editorial operations, overseeing news content, opinion pieces, career advice, blogs, and other features. Doug uh, speaks widely about higher education. He's been on C-SPAN, National Public Radio. His work has appeared in the New York Times, USA Today, the Christian Science Monitor, and many, many other outlets. Uh, Doug was the managing editor of the Chronicle of Higher Education from 1999 to 2003. Before that, he worked at the Chronicle since 1986 in a variety of roles, and he started as an athletics reporter and editor. He's won three uh, national awards for education reporting from the Education Writers Association, including one in 2009 for a series of inside higher ed articles uh, he co-wrote on college rankings. And I bet we'll hear something about college rankings today. Uh, he began his career as a news clerk at the New York Times, grew up in Shaker Heights, Ohio, and graduated in 1984 from Princeton University. Doug lives with his wife, Sandy, and their two children in Bethesda, Maryland. And with that, take it away, Doug. Uh, great. Thanks to Neil and, and Cato and to Judith and, and Chia for uh, having this panel, which I think is a really, uh, uh, this session, which I think is a really interesting topic. Um, I'm guessing there's a fair bit of variation in the degree of knowledge in the audience, just because uh, most of the people I know in real life, outside my professional life, have no idea what accreditation is. And I, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time describing it, and I imagine it'll sort of seep out through uh, the comments of our panelists. But essentially, the higher education accreditation system is the uh, mechanism that the federal government, through which the federal government essentially subcontracts out uh, to a group of uh, re uh, regional, in one case, and, and, and national and, and specialized agencies, uh, the sort of quality assurance of colleges and universities. Um, these are these are sort of uh, peer review organizations uh, made up of their their members, uh, their member colleges or their member programs. In, in the case of specialized accreditors, and the the goal, the federal government sort of keeps its um, uh, essentially they they hold the key through their uh, approval to the the federal. Uh, student aid programs, so institutions uh, need a form of institutional accreditation to, to, so that their students can receive federal financial aid. 
Um, the, there has been, for the almost 60 years or so that this system has been in place, uh, pretty constant uh, questioning of the system. It has intensified uh, of late. It is um, it, the really intense question, questioning started arguably about a decade ago when uh, the last presidential administration and, and the commission that was created by, Mar by Margaret Spellings uh, in 2005 which basically just decided, sort of viewed there to be that some of the problems that Neil was talking about uh, in, in terms of quality and affordability and, and uh, access to higher education and decided that because accreditors touched a lot of institutions and that institutions had to work through those accreditors, that the accreditors would be, a, a, that pressuring the accreditors to put pressure on colleges was gonna be an efficient way of trying to bring about systemic change in higher education. Um, that is sort of a, that, that premise um, has been uh, more than embraced by this, institu by this administration. Um, our, uh, Margaret Spellings sort of went a couple steps too far in the eyes of Congress and was forced to back down. Um, she tried to get the, the accreditors to essentially uh, set, a, uh, set a set of um, requirements on, on, on the accreditors to put on their institutions in terms of student learning outcomes. Um, the, even though Congress got them to back down, the accreditors got the message and they have themselves really turned up the pressure on, on colleges on student learning outcomes. Um, the accreditors, like most people in higher education, thought that when a new administration, a new democratic administration came to town, it would be friendlier uh, and arguably less, uh, less intrusive, and uh, they have been wrong. Um, and uh, this administration, I think, has been, uh, it has been much more supportive financially, but uh, just as inclined as the previous administration to try to get the attention of higher education sometimes with a two by four. Um, and with a pending review of the main law that, that sort of governs higher education, the Higher Education Act, there is lots of discussion about what might be done to change, overhaul, even replace uh, the accreditation system. Um, so uh, at that, I'm gonna turn it over to the three smart analysts we have here to share their thoughts. Um, uh, for going first is gonna be Neil, who you just met. Uh, to my immediate left is Judith Eaton, who's the president of the Council for Higher Education Accreditation. And on her left is Andrew Kelly, director of the Center on Higher Education Reform at the American Enterprise Institute. Um, at that, time for Neil. I kind of feel like I already just talked to you, but okay, I'll, I'll go again. Um, but actually, Doug did a lot of what, what I'm gonna say. Uh, and, Compared to a lot of people you're going to hear from this morning, I am not really an expert on accreditation. I don't know the, I mean, I know something about it because I do higher education work, but I don't know the nuts and bolts, the day-to-day -day policy work that goes on in, accredit in accreditation. Uh, and uh, like Doug suggested, I'm probably not alone in that. Most people, many people at least, probably don't know a whole lot about how accreditation works, why it's here. Maybe they don't even know that it's going on at their college or university. Um, and that's a major reason that we're having this discussion today, is hopefully to sort of raise the consciousness about what accreditation is and what the threats may be to it and through it, and maybe what function, what positive functions it can, uh, it can have in higher education. Now, I'm not involved, though, or I'm not uninvolved or as uninvolved as I am because I think it's too esoteric uh, or because I'm lazy, although laziness always plays a part in what I do or don't do. Um, it's because I, I haven't spent as much time on it because I think there's a deeper root problem that affects accreditation in all of higher education. And again, Doug mentioned it. Uh, and I think that this root problem will keep there, will prevent uh, major reform, meaningful reform, especially lasting reform from occurring for accreditation or any other higher education quality control. And that is the federal funding of students. Federal student aid, I think, is our root problem. Uh, and, and of course, people are likely to disagree with that, and that's gonna be part of the fun, I hope, of today's event. Um, as you've heard, and you're no doubt going to hear some more, accreditation has, at least over time, assumed this major gatekeeping role for uh, federal dollars. If you want to get federal student aid, 
and almost every institution takes federal student aid. You have to go, as an institution, you have to be accredited. That's the only way that money can go there. And that money is substantial. So let me just try and put that into some context. In 1970, using inflation-adjusted dollars, total federal aid, including grants, loans, tax credits, et cetera, and there's, so there's lots of federal aid, uh, it, it accumulated to about $19 billion. So that's billion, that's pretty big. You know, so even today, billion still means something. But by 1995, so uh, 25 years later, it had ballooned to $52 billion, again, inflation-adjusted numbers. And by 2012, it had hit $170 billion. And $170 billion, even to the federal government, is still a pretty substantial amount of money. And so you can see this major federal investment that accreditors are helping to uh, make sure it is used or try to make sure it is used wisely. Now, of course, a lot of that growth is because you had big increases in enrollment. But even on a per pupil basis, you see major increases in aid. So between 1990 and 2012, federal aid per full-time equivalent student rose from $3,143 to $9,445, so nearly a tripling on a per pupil basis. So the job of accreditors, it seems, in the federal system is essentially to put a seal of approval on schools, sort of that good housekeeper seal of approval, so that federal dollars can then flow to that institution. That raises, though, some immediate problems, and I think the problems that we're going to try and focus on. What happens, for instance, when a school or an entire sector of schools does something wrong or does something politically unfashionable? So I think that arguably, of course, but I think you can, can conclude that a lot of the focus on for-profits, while there are lots of problems in the for-profit sector, much of it seems to be driven by more of an ideological animus to profit in higher ed. It's certainly not the only explanation. And that's largely political. How, if we have federal money going to colleges, do we avoid that sort of political-driven uh, policymaking? especially if there's a lot of federal money involved. Would we expect, if you have some big headline problem in a school that is already accredited, that politicians uh, will just leave accreditation alone to say, do what you were originally intended to do, work collegially with the institutions that are your members so that you can work together to improve? Or will they say, now we need to have compliance and punishment for bad actors? That seems to be the way that politics moves in response to even just anecdotal problems. So I don't think we can expect that the federal government will continue to allow accreditors to do what I think accreditors mainly want their job to be, which is to work with institutions to improve, not to be sort of the scold or the principal. Um, and I think since at least the mid-2000s, probably go beyond further back than that, but at least the mid-2000s, we've seen that the federal government has said the accreditor's role should increasingly be about compliance and punishment. Uh, uh, Doug mentioned the Spellings Commission. So again, we're talking about the mid-2000s. The goal was to establish a quote-unquote national strategy for higher education. They had this commission, commission, commissioned many papers. The many papers put accreditation sort of in the crosshairs to hold it responsible for many of the bad outcomes we had. The ultimate report that came from that commission certainly put responsibility on accreditors. And we've seen then that in this effort, and I think it was truly a well-intended effort, to root out lots of the waste and inefficiencies in higher education, said, look, accreditation has to become a lot more about compliance and conformity. Now, and that's a bad thing, certainly. I mean, I think our higher education system is really good relative to other systems in other countries, our K-12 system, because you do have a lot of uh, independence for institutions. You can have a lot of innovation. You can have students who have different needs, different desires, finding institutions that specialize in those things. So you don't want this sort of uniformity. On the flip side, the Bush administration and to a large extent the Obama administration position was totally understandable. The sticker price of higher education, as we know, has skyrocketed for decades. Debt per, per, per student has increased markedly. Uh, you have large percentages of non-completers. There's lots of debate about how big it is. But you certainly have maybe a third. You could even have a half, depending on the numbers you look at, people who enter college who don't finish at least the program that they enter. Maybe they want individual courses. We don't have perfect information. But it's pretty 
reasonable to conclude we have a big non-completion problem. And then we have a major problem of underemployment for people who do complete. So about a third of people with a bachelor's degree earn a job that don't require that credential. So it's certainly not unreasonable to say there, is, there are big efficiency problems in higher education. And since it's the federal government allocating so much of the money, the Bush administration, the Obama administration, not unreasonably said, we now need to rein in all these excesses. But that leaves you with sort of a bad choice. Do you impose uniformity and kill much of that specialization and independence that's so important? Uh, or do you stay hands off and then you let this really, I think many people perceive rampant waste in higher edu education continue unchecked? To me, the answer, and I hope the answer to everybody else here, is you should do neither. You don't want to crush the independence that makes higher education work so well, but you also don't want massive waste and inefficiency. Um, but basically, the federal government, if federal government is going to be heavily involved, is left with those two choices, it seems to me. Um, now, I should note that this uniformity doesn't have to be imposed through accreditation. And we might be seeing that the federal government's going to work around accreditation. So the Obama administration proposed first that they will rate colleges based on various outcomes, uh, your, your, how much graduates are getting paid, whether or not they've paid back loans and things like that. And that seems to be an effort to work around accreditation, to say, we're going to establish these ratings. And the administration said, and we would like to, to ultimately connect your ability, your eligibility to take Title, fund, title IV or student aid funds as a college based on how you do on these ratings. So maybe that'll be an end runaround. And I should say that many people, I think not unreasonably, think accreditors who have sort of a monopoly position, that they themselves often impose uniformity on schools, that they will try and sometimes to override boards of directors and things like that, because they have their own vision of what they think a college should be. Uh, but this sort of Sophie's choice between uniformity and efficiency remains as long as Washington is supplying so many of the dollars, which is why I don't think the root problem is accreditation. It's that the federal government, as I said, is supplying so much money to begin with, with ultimately cripples the natural check on excess that comes when people pay for something with their own money or money they voluntarily get from someone else. When we don't use our own money and when we get a lot of money from other places, we are not as inclined to say, maybe I don't need to pay for that recreation facility. Maybe I don't need to demand uh, the big recreation facility and classes that I only have to go to on a Monday or something like that. We are happier to accept the price of excess if we're not paying that full price. Um, and so the ultimate solution needs, I think, to be to phase out federal student aid. Now, obviously, politically, that's difficult. But I'd like to, hopefully, we focus on the effects rather than just the politics. We need to make people pay with their own money. I think you'll see efficiency return. People, and we'll see people start to consume higher education that's back at normal prices, reasonable prices. Uh, and I don't think, then, that we'll have this threat to uniformity because you won't have a centralized payer. You'll have millions of individuals paying themselves. Then I think you'll see these new models that we're going to talk about in the second panel really start to function, and not just function, but thrive as people look for these more efficient, effective ways to deliver post-secondary education. Uh, and then I think accreditors can get back to doing what they were originally supposed to do, work with institutions voluntarily to help them improve, and then give them a badge of quality, but rather than working above them and forcing them into compliance. Thank you very much. Thank you, and, and good morning. And a special thanks to Neil for our working together to, uh, to bring you this event today. I want to spend a few minutes talking about uh, the federal government and, uh, as the program indicates, uh, whether it's a threat to accreditors or, or to colleges or to both. Uh, and my response to that is, yes, it is. And I want to look at uh, the why of that, how the threat developed, because I think understanding how we got here uh, may be helpful in trying to, to meet the challenges that are represented by that threat. Uh, my, my bottom line is, is this, that uh, we are on a path in this country 
of taking one system of quality review that for all its limitations has worked extremely effectively over time and replacing it with another. And the new form of quality review will, in my view, have a deleterious impact on higher education in this country, on students, uh, and on society. And, and I say that because the emerging government-directed form of quality review is threatening to three of the essential features of higher education that have helped bring us to the strong system we have today. And, and those are the features of peer review of, of institutional autonomy and academic freedom. There will be a very significant price if these features are, are diminished or indeed if they disappear. Uh, both Doug and Neil have, have spoken to the, the basic features uh, of accreditation, and I won't go into that. But I do want to add that these features that I've mentioned, peer review, institutional autonomy, uh, and uh, academic freedom are at the heart of accreditation as our quality review uh, enterprise. But on to the, the reasons for the threat and what, what we might learn from this. Uh, again, both Doug and Neil mentioned the, the Spellings Commission. Uh, and it's important to note that, indeed, that event was the beginning of a very public criticism of accreditation that has not ceased since 2005-06. Uh, we saw in the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act uh, in 2008 uh, the beginning of a huge expansion of the regulation uh, of accreditation. Uh, why, did, why did we see both of these events? Uh, because, my first reason, again, the government is unhappy with accreditation. It's, it's that straightforward. Uh, we saw in Senator Harkin's hearings on the for-profit sector in 2010, uh, 2012, uh, a very, very serious challenge to not only the for-profit sector, but to accreditation generally. Because over and over again, we heard these schools that are our examples of ineffective functioning, not producing quality, not producing graduates, are accredited. And they were accredited by a range of different organizations. Uh, there's a handful of current criticism uh, of accreditation, uh, reflective of the government's un unhappiness. You've heard these over and over again. Uh, accreditation isn't rigorous enough. Accreditation doesn't address bad actors or substandard institutions or programs. Accreditation is a barrier to innovation. Uh, accreditation is run by peer review. Peer review is inevitably a conflicted approach. Conflict of interest prevails. Uh, accreditation is not meeting society's needs. Graduation rates are too low. Debt, default, tuition are all, all too high. So we've got a, a very unhappy group of folks, whether, whether over on the, the Hill or in the Department of Education with regard to accreditation. Well, that unhappiness has led to action. And at least from my perspective, the government is pretty far along in the decision to do quality review on its own. Uh, if we look at the last uh, several years, uh, House hearings, Senate hearings. We've had 14 House hearings, seven Senate hearings. We've had multiple bills introduced. We've had five negotiated rulemakings. We've had uh, a flurry of executive branch statements and initiatives, uh, all focused, at least some of the time. The hearings have been about much more than accreditation, but all focused, at least some of the time, on criticizing accreditation, complaining about accreditation, and telling us how to fix accreditation. In addition, we've had a number of suggestions for alternatives to accreditation, or at least augmenting accreditation uh, as, as we know it. And this is indeed uh, unusual. But we had, beginning last year, 2013, the, the President's State of the Union address, where, at least in the accompanying document, there was discussion of a federal accreditation system, at least for innovation 
in higher education, speculated, speculating maybe we needed alternative accreditation of some sort. Uh, Neil mentioned uh, the college rating system and that effort to categorize institutions based on value uh, and, and affordability. Uh, there's a bill right now in, in the Senate to establish states as accreditors. There's another bill that would establish national accountability standards that would look not only at accountability, uh, but at value as well. That's Senator Murphy's bill. Uh, Mr. Harkin and Mr. Durbin have a bill on uh, the oversight that would of uh, the for-profit sector creating an oversight committee. And one can say, oh, well, that's for the for-profits. Look at the reporting requirements in that bill and tell me where higher education, to what is higher education accountable in that bill? It is to the federal government, not to accreditation and, and not, to, uh, not to state governments. We had an appropriations bill at one point that would require programmatic accreditation uh, of all programs for which accreditation uh, exists. We've had a bill that would establish a central database of all accreditation actions. Uh, the Congressional Research Service uh, said in a report on accreditation at the end of 2013 that Congress, not colleges and universities, Congress should decide student learning outcomes. We've had lots of discussion, and we may have some here uh, today or some more here today about ending the gatekeeping role uh, of accreditation. And we have a variety of what I call federal quality tools, uh, college navigator, college scorecard, the financial aid uh, toolkit, all of these providing information to students and the public about different features of colleges and universities uh, and helping the public to be informed and, and to make choices. I'm hesitating a bit because I question whether these tools are really about quality. Uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, uh, they are used uh, in that way. So what do we take away from all of this activity? First, that a lot of federal capacity building to judge quality is taking place. Second, that quality is defined in these various efforts, primarily in terms of consumer protection and uh, affordability. And third, that the government is no longer working through accreditation, trying to change accreditation into that compliance mode uh, that, that Neil mentioned, but it is also working around accreditation. The capacity building is an effort to address how can we do the quality review of higher education in, in a different way. So the government's unhappy and the government's taken significant action and both of those are, are uh, part of the threat. The, the third reason uh, I think the threat is there has to do with not the federal government, but has to do with accreditation itself. We have some very important tools in accreditation that have held up for many, many years, stand us in good stead, but aren't working as effectively in the current environment um, as they might. One of those tools is peer review. Is it in today's world the best way to make life and death decisions for institutions or, or programs? And that oftentimes is what accredited status means. If you lose your accreditation, you just may close, and any number of institutions have. The accreditors are charged by the federal government with judging major structural changes in an institution. And if they say no, the future of that institution is going to be altered in a very significant way. That's done on a peer review basis as well. I'm thinking here of life and death situations such as the Community College of San Francisco, whatever you think about the accredited status of that institution and what has been going on there, this is a transformative moment, needless to say, for CCSF. Or I'm thinking about the recent situation with uh, Thunderbird School of Business and the, the effort uh, with Laureate and the accreditor said, no, you can't go forward 
with this structuring effort that, that you have in place. Is peer review the best way to make those kinds of decisions uh, or, or not? Uh, second, uh, standards and the standards that are used by the different accrediting organizations. Standards were developed for collegial review. They weren't developed for compliance review, at least at the institutional uh, level. They are often intentionally aspirational and less than specific. Do we need to be looking at, at how standards are formulated uh, in today's world for the kinds of challenges confronting higher education and accreditation? And third, the, the process of, of quality improvement. I agree with Neil that if, that if you leave us alone in accreditation, quality improvement works, works extremely well. But quality improvement was developed as a way to help decent institutions become better. It was not developed as a tool to take substandard institutions and get them to achieve minimums. So what do we in accreditation need to do with regard to peer review, standards, and quality improvement to provide the best tools we can for review of institutions uh, and, and programs. The federal government's a threat because it's un unhappy with us, because it's decided to do its, its, own, its own approach to quality review, and because traditional accreditations tools are not uh, in, in some ways meeting today's needs. Well, what happens if this threat is, is realized? Uh, three things, I think. One, we're going to see some variant, if you will, of a ministry of, of education. We're going to see the federal government through the Department of Education or otherwise sustain a very active, aggressive uh, role in the management of accreditation uh, and, and higher education. Second, I think we're going to see uh, a diminishing of the self-determination of the higher education enterprise overall. Uh, that self-determination uh, of higher education, the opportunity to provide academic leadership, uh, has been key to our success over the years. Uh, but I see, if we are talking about a ministry environment, I see greater and greater difficulty with peer review uh, because it will be in increasingly constrained by regulation uh, and, and by law. But peer review is essential to defining quality in higher education. It's not just back scratching. We'll see uh, additional challenges to institutional uh, autonomy. Uh, yet we rely on it. It's not leave me alone. Institutional autonomy is about, the, is about the responsibility and opportunity to exercise leadership at the institutional level. An interest in academic leadership at the institutional level is, in, in my view, never been, never been lower than it is right now. And thirdly, there are concerns with regard to academic freedom. Uh, we need, on the one hand, responsibility and accountability, but on the other hand, uh, a clear understanding of the space and opportunity for faculty to engage in high quality teaching, uh, teaching and research. So uh, we do have a threat. Uh, it's, it's there for a variety of reasons. Uh, if it's not contained in some way, uh, I am suggesting that the result for all of us will be uh, a much less desirable higher education enterprise than we have today. Thank you. Thank you for having me in the cleanup spot after three smart people who've already said a lot of what there is to be said about accreditation. Um, uh, I'm Andrew Kelly, and from AEI, yeah, just to remind you all, um, uh, I think that uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the different options that are on the table for reforming accreditation and some of the political dynamics that, that are sort of um, underlying those uh, here at the federal level, um, and help, hopefully to help people think through um, 
what the different uh, fault lines are here. So um, I thought Neil actually uh, hit the nail on the head um, with respect to why are we seeing all this activity around accreditation reform. It's because the cost of college is hitting um, families in their pocketbooks. It's hitting the, it's hitting, hitting the median voter in their pocketbook um, um, directly. And so there's a lot of frustration on the part of um, um, constituents uh, about their ability to get their, um, their kids off to college. And so Congress does, um, you know, does one of two things usually. They either um, uh, don't do anything at all or um, they overreact, right? And so I think we're seeing, um, uh, we're seeing a tip in the uh, pendulum toward um, uh, uh, a lot of reaction to this, right? And I think because it's real, there's a lot of anxiety about what do I do for my child um, uh, if the sticker price of a private nonprofit college is a quarter of a million dollars, right, for four years of school. Um, so, uh, so don't, don't underestimate how important that is as a, as a pressure on, on members of Congress, um, regardless of party, I might add, um, that's a real, that's a real, a real issue. It's a bread and butter issue. It's a middle class issue, um, uh, which is a big group of, uh, uh, of voters. So, um, you know, that, that all being said, accreditation is a really popular scapegoat for, um, for all that ails higher, higher education, right? I think we can, we can agree that, that, uh, um, you know, and, and even, even frankly, in the, in the opening discussion, there were a lot of problems kind of interlocking, right, that, that, that um, it's not always clear that we've clarified exactly what it is accreditors are in the way of or are causing or are, or are doing, right? If it, Neil, Neil it sound, from, from Neil's perspective, it sounds like accreditors aren't doing anything wrong. It's just the power that they've been given by the federal government that's the problem to control the flow of federal dollars, right? Um, uh, you talk to other people who are um, sort of on the uh, entrepreneurial side, the ed tech side, right? And they say, well, we'd love to do some of the stuff, um, uh, so, some new innovative models of delivery that are lower cost, but we can't do it because the creditors tell us no, or we can't partner with institutions, like in the case of Thunderbird or Altius, right? Because the, um, the creditors tell us no. Um, you know, so it's simultaneously, right? Simultaneously blamed for being a few things, right? It's it's blamed for being a poor mechanism for quality control and consumer protection, right? It's not that good housekeeping seal of approval. I think people have made that point over and over again. It's uh, blamed for being costly and intrusive, right? Um, for good schools that are just trying to do good work, right? It uh, it, 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 Im, it imposes compliance costs that then raises tuition. Uh, tuition costs even further. And then lastly, the, as a barrier to innovation, right? There's lots of other problems that it's been blamed for, but those are the three that sort of stick out to me. Some of this is certainly correct. Some of it might not be, right? So, um, you know, it seems relatively clear to me that accreditation um, is not much more, uh, is a signal of, of uh, eligibility for federal money and not much more than that, right? And that may be a regulatory floor. Um, it probably is. But it's it's probably it's a low one, right? If you look at the outcomes for colleges and universities um, that are all accredited and in good standing with their accreditors, often, right? Um, so uh, uh, you know, it's also not transparent, right? Reviews aren't posted publicly, oftentimes, and it's not clear that even if they were posted publicly, that they'd be all that helpful. Um, uh, they're really, really thick documents. They're very detailed. I mean, it's a re it's a real um, it's a real testament, I think, to how much work goes into an accreditation review. That they are as impenetrable as they as they are, um, uh, uh, and I, you know I mean that in the, the best possible way. Um, um, you know, likewise, though, though though we talk a lot about barriers to innovation um, that the accreditation agencies set up, we see example after example of institutions that are allowed to do new things that the accreditors give their blessing to new programs, right? To to competency based assessment, to um, to you know uh, direct assessment, to online programs, to any number of things. And so that leads people to say, oh, well, maybe accreditors aren't the problem, right? Um, maybe the problem is the department, or maybe the problem is state regulators, right, that are, that are getting in our way. Um, you know, at the same time, though, uh, to be accredited, you have to be degree granting, right? And right now, there's lots of, inst there's lots of educational providers that are providing education courses and uh, competencies and certifications that are not degree granting in the traditional sense. And so they can't get accredited currently. Um, uh, uh, though, you know, that, though, though we could see that changing as well. Um, so, uh, so this is all to say that it's, 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 um, it's really important, I think, that policymakers and the people who write about accreditation clarify exactly what it is these, these problems are, right? And, and, and make sure that we know what the various policy levers are that we have to attack the different problems, right? Breaking down accreditation as a barrier to innovation is a much different question than making it an informative consumer protection signal, right? And so... Um, fixing accreditation means a lot of different things. So quickly, just politically, um, 
and politically is a bad word to use what I'm about to describe, but I'm thinking about it as what are the various approaches, uh, what are the various views of the accreditation system, right? And the first is the most uh, conservative with a small c, okay? Not sort of conservative in the traditional ideological sense, but that is, um, you know, accreditation is a purely private uh, uh, system of regulation of colleges and universities, and the, uh, and the higher education market is voucher funded, um, um, and students have choices as to where to go, and therefore we have a functioning market, and the accreditation system works pretty well um, uh, in that regard. Um, there are people on Capitol Hill that seem to share this perspective. It's not, and I don't think it's the fact, I don't think that they're satisfied with accreditation per se, so much as they, um, uh, you know, they, they would want to streamline the process and make it less costly, um, but basically leave the, the generic system intact, right? Um, um, there's a second view of accreditation, and that, that highlights the fact that it's a poor mechanism for quality control and consumer protection, right? I think we've seen this a lot with, um, with the hearings where they've dragged accreditors out in front of, um, uh, of a congressional panel and, and read them a riot act for, for approving for-profit colleges, for approving partnerships between nonprofits and for-profits. Um, um, you know, that's, that, that, that I think has generally been a democratic position, that accreditation doesn't function well to protect consumers. Um, and so the question then that, that, that Democrats ask is how can we sort of make it more muscular and supersize it, right? Um, um, and make it measure the right things. Um, and then I think, but I think there's a third, there's a third um, perspective here. And the third perspective casts accreditation as a cartel-like system that's anti-competitive, right? It controls entry to the market. It also controls exit from the market, frankly, right? As long as you have your accreditation, you're unlikely to exit the market. You can still attract students and federal loan money, right? Which causes a serious problem for, for a functioning market because surplus demand always can flow to these poor performing institutions, right? So here, right, here, here federal action, um, uh, federal action, it, you know, put it in quotes, whatever that might be, federal action is more akin to trust busting, right? It's akin to um, taking a market that's currently anti-competitive and injecting, uh, breaking down those monopolies and injecting some competition into it, right? Um, I think the third, the, the, the first and the third, between the first and the third is a fault line among Republicans now. Um, that's my impression. Um, and that is that there are some Republicans, so, so um, uh, Judith mentioned the bill um, introduced by Mike Lee that would devolve some of this power to, uh, to the states, right? States could apply to become accreditors. Um, that to me fits, more, fits very much in that third category. Um, it, would, it would be empowering a, a new set of challengers to do the job um, that accreditors to traditionally do. Um, um, but there is, uh, but, but meanwhile, we've heard, you know, uh, the Spellings Commission, I think, fits in that second one, right? Which was, let's make accreditation, let's try and co coerce accreditation into being what we want it to be at the federal level, right? Um, and you saw congressional Republicans did not appreciate that and did not side with that, right? Um, um, and so... Um, so those seem to be sort of the different, you know, th that's how I see the different sort of politi political, um, political fault lines. Um, and I'll just say, I mean, I'll just say this quickly. So on the, on the sort of, on the third perspective, right, I think, um, and I, I wouldn't include Neil in this because I think, I think Neil, Neil, um, Neil's presentation did not touch on this and I don't think he would agree with this. Um, but, but, but many Republicans have deluded themselves into thinking that this is a functioning market. Right? Think about what Republicans and conservatives write about K-12, right? It's all about getting vouchers to fund privately, private, private schools, right? And if we just make people mobile, if we make the, fed, the public money mobile, right, and that people can use it anywhere they want, at any kind of provider they want, right, that we'd have a functioning market that would, that would raise all boats, right? You, 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 I've heard Republican policymakers on the Hill say, K-12 needs to be more like higher education, right? I mean, they've said this over and over and over again, right? And so it raises the question as to what, you know, do we have a functioning market and are the, as it stands, and does accreditation play a fruitful role in that, in, in, in cultivating that market or not? Um, and for me, for me, generally the answer, the answer is no, but it's for, it's for specific reasons, right? It's, it's, it's the ones I already highlighted. It's, it, it poses a barrier to entry for lower cost competitors who might offer a different product that doesn't look like a traditional college or a degree program. It also keeps the barriers to exit high because in, it's very hard to put an institution out of business, right? They're too big to fail. CC, community, City College of San Francisco is too big to fail. It's 85,000 students, right? Probably more than that if you count part-timers. 
And so, if we, so the argument over and over and over again about why they shouldn't lose their accreditation has been, where will all those students go, right? So what do you do then as a, as a set of regulators, right? If, 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 you can't, if you can't put a school out of business because it's too big. Um, so uh, I'll finish up quickly. I think, so I think, um, and, and the, the, the sort of, um, the different approaches I think map very well onto some of the strategies we see in Emerge. And I'll just go through this quickly. So the first is coer coerce accreditors into, into changing the way they measure and evaluate colleges. This was the Spellings Commission effort. This was, I think, what some Democrats have in mind um, when they introduce bills that are particularly geared toward the for-profit um, sector. But, but I think Judith's right. They have potential to expand. Um, fit the round um, peg into the square hole, right? Let's just try and pound them into something that they, that they weren't designed to do a long time, you know, when, when we first gave them this power. The other, the, the other strategy would be, frankly, to just give the Department of Education, give 400 Maryland a lot more power over who gets certified to get access to Title IV money, um, who's, who's legitimate and who's not, right? Um, um, I think that's, I think I, th I think I agree with Judith. I think that's where uh, the president's State of the Union was headed in some ways. It didn't get much traction. Um, and I do think that that's, a, that's some of the thinking on the part of um, folks on the left who want to reform accreditation is, well, we should house more of this here because we can judge what, what belongs in the program or not. Um, the third is to just do away with the gatekeeping power completely and then require institutions to disclose data and pass a test of financial health. This is, I'm looking at Arthur Rothkopf in the front row. This is Arthur, um, Arthur and Ann Neal uh, uh, Arthur Rothkopf and Ann Neal proposed this as an alternative system um, with some expedited review of good colleges that have a good track record. Um, and let the market do the rest, right? Let the market sort it out. And then the fourth is the, la is the, is the point I made uh, up top, which is empower jurisdictional challengers to do the job as well, right? Do nothing, don't touch the existing accreditation system. Just empower new parties to do this, right? Um, and so whether you support that, so, so you know, I'm, I come from a, a, a right-leaning think tank, we're at a right-leaning think tank. Um, if you, whether you support that third perspective, I think, depends on what you think the appropriate role for the federal government is, right? If, the federal gov if part of the federal government's role is to ensure that markets are competitive and function effectively, um, then, then, then that might be a, an approach that has promise. Um, if you don't, and you think that it currently, that, 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 um, accreditation in and of itself can, can serve that role, um, then, then I would see why you'd be opposed to it. Um, and then the last thing I just want to say quickly, you know, so, so just, to throw some, just to throw some questions on the table, would taking the gatekeeping power away from accreditation agencies be federal overreach? Because they gave it to them in the first place. Just throwing it out there, right? Not, not, not to necessarily say that I agree with it, that that's the right approach, but is that a federal overreach? It's a sort of strange definition of federal overreach, right? Um, um, is empowering alternative pathways or alternative accreditors federal overreach? They've always done this, right? They've always had the power to do this. So it's kind of curious that, 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 that devolving some of this power to states would be federal overreach into a market, right? Um, and then the last thing I just want to say quickly is, as a threat to accreditation, right, one of the things to, to, to remember is that if accreditation agencies don't want to submit to the department for approval, they don't have to, right? They can still do the process of peer review. And the question is, would any of them pass the market test of being good enough at what they do to encourage institutions to pay all the money to get reviewed by an accreditor if they didn't need it to get federal financial aid? And I don't know the answer to that question, but, but I would guess that the answer is probably no. Um, so, uh, so I think I threw out some provocative questions at the end there. Thank you very much. Um, well, that, those were three really interesting presentations. Um, they gave me a lot to think about. I guess, Andrew, to I'd sort of start with, to me, the, the, the question is less about whether these all, some of these possible alternatives are federal overreach than, than, that, than whether they'll be effective. I mean, I guess part of the reason I have sort of, and I'm really interested in Judith's suggestion that the rating system is a, uh, is a, uh, a workaround. I guess to me, when I have looked at the possible, um, uh, sorry, I'm getting a signal. I'm not sure what that's supposed to be. Do you want me to go up here? No. <laughs> Playing a game of charades. Oh, I think we can move the microphone there. Okay. I've learned all our, okay. our when there they send in a play, sorry. I there can tell good. you what it is. All right, that's good to know. So we're sweeping, okay. you're sweeping left. Got it. it. Okay, good. Um, where are my blockers? Okay, so um, the, 
to me, when I have looked at the landscape, I have generally seen, I've been skeptical as I think about the uh, phrase about the uh, about the political democracy is the best political system, or the you know the worst political system except for all others. That's sort of how I look at accreditation, and I have not seen viable alternatives presented. And and I guess the when I think about sort of the the some of the things you laid out, uh, and you you know the, the de devolution to the states, the breaking the link. I I tend to agree that those aren't federal overreach is not. I don't think the the flaw in those ideas are federal overreach. I just I don't think they necessarily solve the problem in terms, you know, because the states, the states are a mess in terms of governance of higher education, and um, so I guess, I guess to me, the question I'd ask all three of you is, do you see and 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 listen, replacing, if you believe that the federal government has a role in quality assurance, and I actually moderated a session at a, one of the accrediting meetings over this weekend, where one of the presidents, basically a college president, said she didn't think that there was a federal role in quality assurance, and that the federal government should focus on financial stability and 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 integrity, and and again, sort of let the market decide. At the kind of dollars that we're talking about, I, I have a hard time believing that there's not a federal role of some kind in quality assurance. But so if you believe there's a role in a federal role in quality assurance, is there an alternative, a, a way of getting to that, that, I mean, replacing the accreditation system with anything re close to resembling it would cost way more money than the federal government has to spend on anything these days. So are, do you see viable alternatives? Do you think the rating system if linked to federal aid, which strikes me as unlikely to happen, but could be that alternative? I'd start Maybe start with Andrew and then go to Judith. Or start with Judith. Um, so I think, um, one, one of the, I'll put it this way. Um, so to start with, the reason I raised the question about federal overage is mainly because the panel's about federal threats to accreditation. So I was just asking actually sure. whether, whether that's actually a federal threat to accreditation uh, uh, in the way that we think of mm -hmm. centralized management of accreditation right. by the Ed Department as a threat, right? right? It's a different, so it's an end right. run around, right? It's yeah. an end run around fixing accreditation by empowering different people Got to it. do it, right? Sure. And, and, and allowing the existing system to continue to, to work. And, that, and that's what I would say in response. So, um, uh, right, one of the, the, one of the reasons why the this sort of jurisdictional challenge approach, what, you know, this is a, this is a phrase that's, that's been used in other sectors, um, one of the reasons I think that, that 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 policymakers have gravitated toward that is because it 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 it, le it, it leaves the hard work of actually trying to compel accreditors to do di things differently. It leaves that off the table, right? It just says, it just says, let's do this. Let's let's empower a new set of actors to do this. Um, and I might add, right? There's 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 variations within that, right? So one would be, oh, well, what we need is a special accreditor who still goes through the Ed Department's uh, approval process that is designed to do online and competency-based. Right. And I, I don't think that that's, that that's necessarily the best idea because they're still gonna have to go through the, the, the massive sort of um, document that says, here's all the things you have to do if you're recognized by us as an accreditor. So it's not gonna change all that much. But um, the lack of viable alternatives is an incredibly big problem. And that's why I think introduction of bills and, and legislation to discuss and debate the relative merits of is a major step forward compared to just, you know, frankly, bitching and moaning about accreditation for the last 40 years, mm -hmm. right? So, Judith? Um, I think there's a federal interest, not necessarily a federal role in quality assurance, and, and I think we've confused those two, mm -hmm. especially uh, in, in the last 10 years. I think it's reasonable for the federal government uh, that hired us 60-some years ago to be reliable authorities on educational quality, to hold us accountable for evidence of, of quality. But it is not reasonable to sustain the current practice. And the current practice is the federal government is directing and managing accreditation operation. Uh, additionally, what are we trying to accomplish through quality review? It's not just to have a process. It is to work with colleges and universities so they can perform as well as they can to serve students and, and to serve society. Uh, 
if the federal government is going to run quality assurance to what end? I, I never I never see that. All right. I, I don't get any sense other than we'll do it better than the accreditors uh, uh, in in the narrative uh, that is that is out there. While accreditation and we've all said this has its its limitations uh, on the one hand, show me in any of the government suggestions, bills, initiative sh initiatives, show me uh, an approach that takes into account the complexity, the, the diversity, uh, the academic issues that are involved in any, in any academic quality review process. I see nothing but a debate about, about control, and that is not a foundation for an alternative. Yeah, well, it seems to me that if the federal government is going to, in one way or another, direct $170 billion to students, plus it also does have research money and things like that, it sends, of course, it, it, I think it it would have to assume uh, some sort of role in saying, is that money being spent well? But that's why the root problem is that they're expending that money to begin with. And if you think about $170 billion, of course, that is gonna cause a whole lot of people to consume a lot of things and demand a lot of things from college that may have very little to do with academic outcomes, learning exactly what you need to learn to get a job. It will encourage people to say, sure, I'm willing to pay for the school with a bigger recreation facility and where I don't have to take classes more than once or twice a week because you know, I wouldn't have done that if it was my $100, but now I have $200. So why don't I ask for those extra things? So I think we have to, and we have to realize that the federal government is going to attend to whatever it does, since it's really a single entity, it's going to use a bludgeon. It's not going to, the tendency is not going to be, say, let's let a thousand flowers bloom. It's going to say, look, we've had a problem in this sector. Right now, the, the, the main focus is for profits. And they're going to say, so let's have some sort of regulatory bludgeon that applies to for profits. So does it have an interest in the workings and outcomes of higher education, yeah, it has to if it's going to spend that kind of money. The problem is it shouldn't be spending that money to begin with because of the effects it has on what people are willing to demand because it also enables colleges to raise their prices at extremely high uh, rates, extremely fast rates. And I'm, I always have to mention, because I work for the Cato Institute and I'm in the Cato Institute, there's nothing in the Constitution that gives the federal government authority to do this. It's nowhere in the enumerated powers. So for that reason alone, it should get out. But when we look at all the, the extremely deleterious effects that we get from it, it's not just a constitutional or principled issue, it's a reality issue that this doesn't work. Can I, can I just ask a question? So, because I've always wanted to ask this of Neil and never had the opportunity. So, so I, I actually, I really like your distinction between um, a centralized sort of ministry, right, versus millions of individual buyers, right? And so I, I guess what, what, I, what I've always wondered is, because is, I'm, I'm aware of your support for school choice at the K-12 level, right? So, what, so what's, the, what's the big difference, right? Because because technically, and you can disagree with this, and I tend, I tend to think this is inaccurate, but, right, but it's a voucher-driven market in higher ed, right? And so what's the, what's the problem there, right? I mean. Well, okay, I have two answers to that. One, one's a question. Who, who appointed you moderator? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, sorry. But, I, but, he's right. I, I gave, I, I gave, he has my proxy. Right. Oh, oh, well. He winked at me. I don't think we followed Robert's rule of order for any <laughs> right, of this. Sorry, but, sorry. But that's okay, no, because it really is a good question. And if you want to be the moderator, just <laughs> next don't. time, just let me know ahead Doug's of time. Doug's better at it than I am. Um, sorry, Jeff. Um, and you could ask Doug a question then, that's and we'll reverse true. roles. Ooh, no, no, no. Um, but anyway, because that really is an excellent question. And I think at the K through 12 level, we actually need to talk more about all the adverse effects that come with government funding of education. But let's be very clear that we're coming from different directions. So the K through 12 level, for over a century, we accepted this idea that the government would have a monopoly on the supply of schools. And that they would, so it's not just they funded you, they funded the school and you went there. That's quite different from where we were in higher ed, where higher ed was largely, yes, you had public institutions and things, which is a big problem, but it was still a lot more driven in consumer choice. So then we voucherize it. It's actually moving us in a less market-like direction when you move into more federal aid. So what, what I'd like to see at the K through 12 level is, yes, it's moving in the right direction to have 
vouchers. We actually prefer tax credits because there's more choice in whether or not you donate, who you donate to. Um, but it's a matter of starting point and where we'd like to go. So it's a move in the right direction to decouple funding of schools and put it on kids at the K through 12 level. It's a move in the wrong direction to have government take up a funding role in higher education, even if it's attached to students, that it didn't previously have. But isn't the question then, uh, because I think it's unlikely that we're going to see the end of federal student aid. Uh, is, isn't the even Sorry the, to break that to you. Uh, all right. I know that comes as a shock to you. Um, um, Why am I even here? Yeah, for me to say that. Uh, then the question is, on what basis can we justify uh, the, the federal government actually taking on quality review versus turning to the people who know how to do it and, and know the business? to do quality review. I, I understand the argument, more money, we gotta have control, but where's right. the capacity? So I, I think that the problem is, I don't think it, it'll work any better if the federal government does it directly, if the Department of Education tries to do quality control directly versus working with accreditors. It may work a little worse, but I think you're just talking about grades of, uh, of one problem, which is you still have essentially a monopoly of quality control because you have essentially a monopoly of funding. So the problem that would happen for accreditation is one, it is a problem that regional accreditors are essentially given a regional monopoly, or you're, you're essentially having to work with people who are granted a monopoly because of the federal money. And so that causes all sorts of inefficiencies. And then I think the political reality is that if you see a problem help happen, even if it's just one or two institutions, what we see is Politics is so headline driven, not analysis driven, that they'd say, look, we had a problem at University of Virginia or something like that, or, or at Community College San Francisco, or mainly we've seen for-profits, and they say, so we now have to have one rule, basically, for all for-profits. And so it's not that I think that the federal government directly doing quality control would be better than working through accreditation. I think it would be a little bit worse, but I think both have basic monopoly problems. Um, and I should say that, I recognize that politically we're not getting rid of student aid anytime soon. But I also think it's incumbent on, on me uh, and, and maybe on think tanks to try and point out that maybe we're not going to get there right now politically, but this is the root problem. And I think there's actually a fair amount of agreement that it's a, diff it's a very hard problem to solve doing quality control when you're talking about one entity supplying so much of the money for higher ed. And we need to, to face that, I think. So we are at the Cato Institute. Uh, is Andrew's idea about uh, increasing uh, the competitors in the quality review business uh, a way to contain the negative effects, at least in, in the short haul, of the impact of, of federal student? Well, my suspicion is maybe in, in the short term, it may be somewhat valuable if you could start to shop between accreditors. But again, I think once you see some accreditor that has had just a, even a few problems that make headlines, uh, or you don't see the price of college go down, the political response in Washington is going to be, we have to make all accreditors have all these basic same rules, basic same requirements. And so I don't think in the long term you're going to get rid of this push to uniformity that I think is really driven by politics being driven by headlines and sound bites rather than analysis. So one other question that, that uh, occurs to me is, is, is whether we think the, um, we have a systemic problem or a bad apples problem. Um, the sort of, a, and Andrew really effectively laid out sort of the different critiques of accreditation. Um, and the, the, the view that there are some bad institutions, I, I think my sense is that the, um, the rating system as an alternative approach is very much dr driven at doing a better job finding and punishing bad apples. Um, and and the but so do you think that the which which of the do you think that the the, inf the question of sort of whether accreditation functions well and whether quality control is working 
is is more or less determined by one of those arguments than the other. Do you, which do you see as the bigger problem right now? Well, I, so I think I think there's two. There, you have to distinguish between a you know a few different goals here, right? So if your goal if your goal is simply to save money, as a as a federal government, right? Then sure, policing bad actors who who take money and don't provide any product in return that saves you money, right? It's not clear to me though that that does anything to create opportunity. Doesn't it actually? It actually does the opposite, right? It it actually reduce it actually it. would right. It would reduce opportunity, right, out of the gate, right? Because because even if you have a ten percent graduation rate, ten percent of those students are getting something potentially has value, right? So um, that. But if that's the problem you're trying to solve, sure, policing this market and kicking out people that are doing that are not providing a good return on investment that accomplishes that goal. If you if the goal is to create more op educational opportunity. That doesn't do it, and, and and instead, what you need is a proactive deregulatory agenda, right? Where where you're actually allowing in new competitors um, uh, who can compete on a level playing field. And this is where Neil Neil's not Neil Neil's point is exactly right. Um, um, you know, despite the the fantasy of doing away completely with federal student aid, there is a serious tilted playing field against competitors who can't access it, right? Because because if, you, if your choice is between paying out of pocket, let's say for a credit by exam program that isn't eligible for federal aid right now, or paying for the in-residence or in-person community college course, you know, it's a no-brainer if you're getting subsidies for the community college course. That prevents this competition from taking root. And that's a distinct problem from accreditation, um, though, though, though accreditors clearly uh, control access for that former category of institutions mm -hmm. or, or providers. So, you want to add something? I don't know whether that's the question, systemic uh, versus bad actor. I, I think we've got a situation of too much government control on the one hand, uh, an accreditation system that's worked very, very effectively in a number of ways, but is mismatched in some way with the current mm -hmm. key characteristics of, of the enterprise with which we're, we're working, and a whole bunch of people running around saying, saying we can't solve this. <laughs> Implicit in our conversation, and I want to challenge it, is that accreditation is responsible for everything. It's responsible for high tuition. It's responsible for affordability. It's, it's responsible for shareholder decisions in, in a for-profit corporation. Why don't we step back and examine that? What do we want accreditation to do? And th this reauthorization is an opportunity to do that. I'm not terribly optimistic that, th that, it'll, that it'll happen at all. Yeah. Um, I'd love to turn to your questions. I think we have a microphone in the back, so please wait for the microphone. Um, and uh, let me start up here, right up here. Uh, and please announce your name and affiliation. I think we have two microphones coming your way, but here, go ahead. I'm Mitzi Worth. I'm, I'm here as a public citizen, though I am affiliated with some academic institutions, but I don't represent them at this meeting. I'm going to start with my bias, which was John Dewey was my godfather. That's just giving you a sense of um, how much does it cost a school to get accredited? I think, that, and what are the items that you are looking at that say, this is why you're a good school? Mm -hmm. My own experience with the schools I've worked with, um, some really super ones, and I've, I've been primarily in international relations, political science, and economics. And from my perspective, tenure is a paralysis on learning in those domains. Because what I've watched is these academics that got trained in the 60s are still teaching what they learned in the 60s. The younger faculty who have not yet reached tenure have to uh, what they tell me is they have to write about the stuff that the tenured faculty write about, because if they challenge them, they may not get tenure. And it seems to me in a world that is changing at a breathtaking speed, I guess, what do we want these kids to get out of going to college? I'm struck by the number of kids I know that have gone and gotten really good degrees and are unemployable according to what the jobs are. Right. Um, and that there are businesses that saying they want to hire kids just out of high school because they find when they have all this college stuff, 
It doesn't add to, anyway, I think you're dealing with a very complex set of issues, but I don't understand what the accreditation says. Uh, well, and so, by the, the uh, only thing I would say is with peer review, what I've observed is that that becomes a self-licking ice cream cone. That they, you know, the, you write an article and you get your 10 friends to cite it, and in no place is there a, a request it, to say, this is the new body of knowledge that what I've written adds to the bucket. Okay, well, thank you for your, there was a question in there. I, but, but, well, yeah. Um, Judith, maybe if you can answer the question she asked about sort of, uh, about a, sort of the accredita what accreditation aims to do and maybe the extent to which it's, um, I think what was sort of implicit in her statement was that there were, that accreditation maybe doesn't, isn't doing enough to look at um, what happens in the classroom, I sort of, is what I've heard. Uh, how, much uh, how much it costs varies from institution to institution, program to program. It can cost you a million dollars, it can cost you $50,000. So I can't give you a general answer and I cannot give you an average and I, and I wish, uh, I wish that I, I could. Uh, some institutions have published that, that information. Uh, what's underneath the number, I, I don't know in, in most cases. Look, accreditation is about looking at an institution or a program and saying, is it sound? All right, does it meet threshold expectations about its curriculum, about its faculty, about its student services, about its, its finances, uh, and give us evidence that it does meet those, those threshold standards. And if the evidence isn't there, what do we have to do to help the institution or, or the program get better? Institutional accreditation, for the most part, does not drill down to the classroom or the counseling office. We might argue whether that's good or bad, but it generally does not. Programmatic accreditation, on the other hand, often does. What's going on in the laboratory? What, what's going on in the classroom? But in general, and it's very hard to generalize about, about accreditation, accreditors are looking at how well do you do what you say you're going to do? What it, what's the mission of your institution? Are you carrying it out? Are you carrying it out in an appropriate, in an appropriate way? So it is rather general, all right? but can zero in on problem areas and do further work. And, and your question sort of contributes to the view that Judith talked about before about what we're blaming, uh, you know, I think it, it, to the idea that accreditation is responsible for the fact that kids today in an economy where there's lots of underemployment and unemployment aren't getting jobs, you know, the, the holding accreditors accountable is, is really questionable there. Um, I think we have a, a question over there. And, and again, please try to make them questions, if possible. This is a question, James Sang. Um, we've been very general. Can you, uh, in fact, uh, parse out or disaggregate programmatic accreditation versus the general institutional? Because ABET, for example, uh, I don't think quite fits into what most of you guys have been talking about. And so, on the other hand, they're very important. So can you tell me how something like ABET would be influenced by all these changes, proposed changes? Um, first, uh, we've got a... a group of institutional creditors. They look at an entire college or university. Yeah, All right. All right. Programmatic accreditors, of which ABED is one, um, has standards that are very similar in, in a number of ways to the institutional uh, accreditors, and thus are charged with carrying out the same responsibilities. A major difference is that an accreditor like ABET, which is the engineering uh, uh, accreditor, um, has much more specific and explicit standards about uh, the teaching of engineering and engineering practice. That, that is the big difference that, that you see. And they don't have gatekeeping power. Right, I mean, that's the right. other Some big- Some of them do, yes. Yeah. 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 For, yeah. ABED, not ABED not is not federally recognized, right. but there are uh, 30 or so programmatic accreditors that are federally recognized, and they must have. They must have some federal link to have that. I'm talking about nursing law, medicine, dental hygiene, air, that whole area of, of dental education. It may not be Title IV money that's at stake, but it is programmatic money in, say, the nursing area or in, in other health-related But I think, I think your, to your point, I think it's fair to say that most of the conversation today and most of the national conversation is about institutional accreditation. I think that's an important distinction to make 
Um, I think it's where it's where most of the public policy attention is focused. And uh, just to just to say, you know, I think I think there tends to be an assumption among people who know this distinction. There tends to be an assumption that programmatic accreditors are somehow um, more rigorous, maybe, than the institutional creditors. And, and I would just point out that, that there's often it's often some of the same problems because the programmatic accreditors are often tightly linked to the professions and licensure processes and these things. And so they, they exert enormous power over who can do what right. in and, states. And right? they are absolutely accused constantly of driving up costs yep. by requiring certain things to be done that may or may not be linked to educational quality. Yep. But uh, so the second row here. This is a very good uh, meeting and I'm glad to be here. My name is Teresa Lepele. I am the president of the Global Institute for Quality Education. I have been working on quality in education for 25 years. It seems to me, listen to you, that we have been in another planet. <laughs> uh, let me tell you, when you say quality assurance in education, I would like to all of you to tell me what it is. For me, we train the people in the institutions, educational institutions at all levels, and they make quality. <coughs> they go for continuous improvement. Unless we don't have continuous improvement, we cannot talk about quality. Mm -hmm. I was an examiner of the National Quality Award, the Malcolm Baldrige. Probably you are familiar with it. They changed the name because the, the word quality has been used as a qualifying adjective not as a systematic quality improvement process where people is at the center of organizations and people get quality. So if you can tell me what do you mean by quality assurance or quality, please do so. Uh, we're, we're talking about performance and results. We're, performance. Right. Yes. And I'm, I'm fine with that. And I agree with you that quality is a, is a troublesome word in many, many ways. Look, we invented Colleges and universities, well, we didn't, all right? Um, we have colleges and, and universities. Their intent is to educate their, their students. Well, do they do it? How well do they do it? All right. And then we have some tacit agreements, and I hope we're not going to go beyond that. All right. We have some tacit agreements about what works well and what doesn't work well and which institutions are more, more effective uh, than others. But it's performance and results that we're looking at and to get to performance and results, you do look at operation to some extent. I'm very aware of accreditation, but we should hold the names that matter. Fair, okay. fair, fair point. Fair point. Yeah, I, I think this is a really an interesting, important question, which is probably more broad than we can deal with in just these answers. But I really think that question about what constitutes quality is a really good one. And the fact is, there's all sorts of disagreement on what quality is and what people want to get out of higher education. This is a fundamental reason you don't want one system of quality control. So a, a very basic cleavage is, do people want good teaching or is good research what you want? A lot of students would go for teaching. A lot of faculty would say it's good research, or maybe it's both, maybe it's neither. You know, one of the things, as I understand it, that some accreditors look at is community relations and things like that. That may be important to people. It may not be important to some people. What about people who go to college just to build their social networks? So the, the reason this quality question is important is we throw out quality, but we never define it. And when we do define something, it is usually very narrow. So when you look at what's been proposed, at least for these ratings, it looks like the main measure of quality is, is financial. Are you getting a good job that pays you a lot of money and enables you to pay off your loans? But for some people, they might go to college and they don't have a, their end goal isn't great employment, it's to learn more about you know, art or medicine or whatever it is. So I think we have to be very clear when we talk about quality, it can mean different things for different people. Well, I mean, I think, I, I think, I think, I think you um, are, are, and I hate to say this to, in case anybody here, you know, Washington, doesn't do complex well. It likes simple. <laughs> and that's, you know, it I mean, can turn a lot of us into maybe that we should be joining Cato to think that maybe the federal government can sort of only mess things up when it gets involved because it policy doesn't deal well with complex. Um, uh, we have probably time for one or two more questions. We'll probably do two. Okay, right there, this, this like halfway back. Will Estrada, I handle a federal education policy for Homeschool Legal Defense Association. 
I had a question for Andrew and then a quick question for Judith. Andrew, you said accreditation agencies do not need to provide or submit to Department of Education review. And I was very intrigued by that, if you could expand a no. little more on that. He's, he's, and then Judith, you said um, that if the Department of Education becomes almost like a ministry of education, that you have concerns about academic freedom yeah. and want to just hear a little bit more about that. Uh, so to clarify, um, what I meant was that if an accreditation agency didn't want to, ha to have gatekeeping power for, um, uh, for Title IV, um, then they, w they would not have to be recognized by the department. You could, like, right, there's consultancies out there that help institutions to do better at what they do, and they are fee-for-service and enterprises. They are not certified by the education department because they don't fun function as an accreditation agency in, in the, in, based on the definition that is in the federal legislation. That, that was the point I was trying to make. All I was saying is that if the threat from the feds is so great to the mission of accreditation agencies, then they can just opt out of the, opt out of the federal control over that. Right. right? His, I mean, that's right. right. His David point is an example of an accreditor right. that did. Right. His point is that it, the original mission of accreditation, and, and people have talked about the, allowing the accreditors to return to that of quality improve, of institutional improvement, and um, you can do that now as long as you don't also seek to award, to, to have your stamp of approval provide the keys to the federal treasury. Right, and the, and the, and the point being that we've gotten to a lot of these issues that, that accreditation is costly, it's time consuming and so on. And so the question then is, would, any, would, would institutions take it upon themselves to partner with existing accreditation agencies if the federal money weren't on the hook? And that's, that's the open yes, question. I think they would. I disagree yeah, yeah, right. with Doug yeah. on that one. But that, to answer this gentleman's question, um, I, I see a fence being built around the options that faculty can exercise. And that's why I'm in the academic area. And that's what I mean by my worry with regard to academic freedom. We've now got federal regulation for credit hours. Uh, we have federal regulation on transfer of credit. Uh, we have federal regulation that affects general education. We have federal, uh, federal regulation that affects student achievement. Well, the, this is the arena of the faculty and faculty leadership. So it's not that I see somebody interfering with rights. I see somebody building a fence around the arena of decision making and discretion with regard to academic judgment. Um, uh, let's see, in the very back, uh, Hello, this is Jeff Martineau. This is for Judith. Um, on your question on autonomy, yeah. um, it's $180 billion, you know, $100 million. How, how can we balance autonomy with the fact that the taxpayers are giving the money to the schools? I mean, the, at some point, we might have to recognize there's going to have to be some kind of oversight, but then how do we make sure that they don't interfere with what the school wants to do? Autonomy is not leave me alone. Autonomy is about uh, where's the best place to make academic judgments in this country? I, I submit it's a college or, or university. I submit it's faculty and academic administrators and governing boards. We have a whole oversight apparatus at that level right now. Now, the federal government, in my view, should hold us accountable for what we do, but that's different from deciding what we do. And that distinction is lost. In answering this, this gentleman, and I went through the litany of just a few things, and Jeff, you know there are a lot more, for which there's federal regulation, all of which belong in, in the academic arena, I think that's inappropriate. I think it's reasonable for the federal government to say, okay, institution, you're making these judgments, you're moving forward. Tell us what are reasonable results from your perspective. We'll talk to you about that. We wanna make sure that things are going well, but that's different from running, running the operation. And we're moving into running the operation through the level of regulation uh, that keeps becoming greater and, and greater. So institutional autonomy is not leave us alone. It's hold us accountable rather than directing our work. Um, I think we're going to have to let that be the last word for this panel. Um, we will have more after a short break. I want to offer thanks to Andrew and Judith and Neil, uh, and thank you for uh, listening so politely.